Um, okay. Um, so, uh, yes, I am uh, speaking from Cape Cod, and uh, I'm really happy to be able to have this connection with Ossining, which was a very important place for me. Um, and it's uh, starting to talk about Edward Hopper. I have a real affinity for him in several ways. Uh, one is the NIAC connection. I lived in Rockland County for many years. And I um, uh, actually did figure drawing in Hopper's house where he was born. Um, and I had a studio in Nyack for a while. I also have a connection to uh, the village. I spent a lot of time there in my single years. Um, and he lived on Washington Square. We'll get to that later. And then the third thing is Cape Cod where he had a house in Truro, uh, which is still standing. And that's where I am now. So uh, three things that we have in common. And I actually just thought of a fourth thing we have in common. Um, Hopper was extremely tall. <laughs> um, he was over six feet by the time he was an adolescent. Uh, he, I think he finally grew to about six, six and was very kind of reserved in his early years because of that. So another uh, thing I have in common with Edward Hopper. <laughs> Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do, as I usually do, is mute everyone now. I'm going to share my screen, and I'll take questions and comments at the end. So just give me a second to do all that. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So um, I'm just gonna start talking about the importance of Edward Hopper. We'll get into more specifics later. Um, he really captured the isolation of the individual within the very rapidly changing modern city, the more urban environment um, that was growing during his lifetime. Um, he used light extremely effectively. Um, there was not a lot of action in his paintings. Um, he sort of left them kind of open-ended, let the viewer kind of make a story out of what they saw. Um, you had to do a little work, but he really captured the inner life of his subjects and uh, made a really strong um, influence on later artists throughout his life. Uh, so let's start talking about uh, the beginnings here. This is the house in Nyack, which is still standing. It's on Broadway. Um, he was from a fairly uh, well-to-do family. Uh, the, his parents were very supportive of the arts. They introduced him and his sister here uh, to the arts very early in their life. They went to the theater, concerts, museums, um, and... Uh, so they were always very supportive of his ambitions. Um, so here he is. Um, so as I said, he was very tall as a young boy and was uh, very kind of reserved, um, but spent a lot of time with his drawings and paintings. Um, this is something he did at age 13. Uh, I think you could see his talent. And this one is from age 16. I guess he was influenced by the Hudson River. And uh, here's a self-portrait he did at the age of 20. And uh, another one later on. And there's a couple of photographs. Uh, he married Joe Hopper um, in uh, 1924, I believe, and she became uh, the strongest supporter of his work throughout his life and his uh, really constant model, um, uh, especially in his later paintings. And there's one of her. So uh, he did go to art school. He went to the New York School of Art. Uh, he studied with William Murray Chase, who um, uh, founded that school. Uh, here's another picture of Joe. And the, here's the, uh, the place in Washington Square that they lived and his New York studio. 
So, all right, so before I get to the illustration, he, um, he did, as I say, studied with uh, William Murray Chase and Robert N. Rye um, and uh, was influenced by them with their sort of uh, attention to sort of the gritty side of, of urban life. Uh, one of his classmates was George Bellows of the Ashcan School uh, and Rockwell Kent. Um, so it took him actually quite a long time to make it as a fine artist. He was an illustrator for about 20 years. Um, so he started working for an advertising agency and then for some private firms. Uh, so it was about 20 years of doing these illustrations, very much in the um, style that was popular at the time. Uh, this is one he did uh, for World War I, um, a propaganda poster, as you see, Smash the Hun. Uh, it was a prize-winning poster, and um, this was done, as you see, in 1919. On some more of his illustrations. Um, he did some beautiful work in with drawings and uh, etchings, so you see here, uh, and you can start to see his fascination with the effects of light and nocturnal scenes. And this one also, a very famous um, print that he made, uh, which is a lot like many of his later paintings. Um, so he had several influences, I'm sorry. Um, Thomas Eakins was one of them. Um, as I said, he studied with Chase that you see here and uh, Robert N. Rye. Um, and he also went to Europe, um, but in the early part of the 20th century, uh, spent quite a bit of time in Paris. Um, and this was when the Impressionist movement was really becoming um, very important and more accepted than it was initially. Uh, and they encouraged him to do uh, plein air painting. And um, I'm sorry, I keep going too fast. Uh, he also saw this uh, famous Rembrandt, The Night Watch, which he thought was one of the most wonderful paintings he had seen. Uh, Vermeer, um, I see a real connection here. Another one of my favorite artists. Um, the idea of windows is something that uh, occurs throughout his, um, his paintings, uh, the light coming through the window, as well as the idea of a single figure uh, involved in an activity, very quiet, um, self-absorbed. Um, and again, you can sort of make your own narrative out of these paintings. Uh, Degas was another really strong uh, influence on Hopper. Uh, he was very intrigued by the unusual perspectives and composition uh, of Degas. Um, also the fact that he was concerned, unlike most of the Impressionists, he was working in indoor settings um, and uh, just sort of capturing a moment in time. Uh, and this is another one showing, again, women doing sort of everyday activities, uh, you know, not necessarily the most flattering poses. Uh, Manet, another really important influence on him, uh, showing the um, sort of everyday life of modern um, Paris here. And this one actually involves a train, you see uh, the smoke uh, coming from the train in the distance. And uh, trains were another uh, sort of obsession of hoppers that we'll see later on. Uh, Matisse, uh, another influence. And again, we have this idea of windows, uh, interior spaces and exterior spaces and the juxtaposition of the two. And um, You'll see what I mean as we look at more hoppers later. So let's look at some of his early works. Um, this is called Girl at Sewing Machine. And uh, definitely uh, there's a similarity between um, Vermeer's women doing sort of everyday domestic activities um, 
uh, and the light sort of illuminating them, as you see here. So this idea of the window, um, it's probably New York City. Um, you can kind of tell these yellow bricks on the window there. Uh, by the way, I meant to mention um, that I really hope that many of you have seen the Hopper exhibit. Unfortunately, it closed two days ago. Um, and it, it was really worthwhile. Um, so that exhibit was really about his work uh, relating to New York City. Uh, we'll be going a little beyond that tonight. Uh, so here we have House by the Railroad. Um, now, this is one of his most iconic works. Um, it's a house that is still standing. It's in Haverstraw in Rockland County. Um, and it's... Um, it was very important. It was the first painting that was um, bought by the Museum of Modern Art, which had just, uh, this happened in 1930. Uh, the museum opened just about a year or two earlier than that. And uh, it's really started this period of success for Hopper. Um, and uh, he, by 1933, he actually had a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, so we have this house here, um, and uh, it's called House by the Railroad. Um, you can see there's the railroad tracks in front, sort of dividing us, separating us from the house. Uh, there's really no sign of habitation in this house. Um, so uh, there's a sort of sense of mystery about it. Um, and uh, you can also see his interest in the way the light affects the architecture, uh, the shadows that fall on the side of the house. And this is something he was preoccupied with uh, his entire life. Um, one thing that really um, was very exciting to Hopper was the fact that this house became the uh, inspiration for the house in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Um, and he he and Joe were huge fans of uh, movies, so that was very gratifying to him. Um, he did a series with restaurants and uh, automats and, and things like that, um, and showing um, just sort of a snippet of life in these settings. Uh, we don't really know who these people are, what their story is, um, but uh, certainly depicting a, a, a period of time um, that uh, is very specific. Um, this is one of these paintings, these window paintings. Again, you know, we looked at Matisse and his window paintings. Uh, but these are a little different. Um, he, as I said, he was very interested in trains. He rode the elevated railway in New York and um, would capture these little uh, vignettes of life uh, he, as he passed by. Uh, so you see just part of figures and he was, uh, you know, very intrigued by this and this became very inspirational for him. So uh, you see many of these uh, window paintings. Uh, so here's Automat and um, you have this single figure uh, and very much alone. Um, I don't know, some of you may have seen a recent documentary about the Automats, um, really interesting. Um, the thing about the Automat was that you, often went there alone. It was really very acceptable to uh, eat as a, a single person there. Um, so even though often you were surrounded by hordes of people, there was just a certain isolation about it. Um, another thing, my, my grandparents always loved the automat. Um, and they pointed out that um, in the automat, you didn't really have to converse with anyone. You just put your coins in the machines um, and for recent immigrants who may not have been very um, comfortable with speaking English, that was definitely an advantage. Um, so you, know, you see this woman, um, this was a time when women were entering the workforce um, in much larger numbers. And um, this was a uh, population that he was very interested in. 
Uh, so this painting um, definitely has a similarity to a, a painting by Degas, um, a little bit different. It's called Absinthe. Uh, these are two figures that are in a bar. Uh, you see the sort of greenish liquid in front of the woman. Um, but you can really see that even though they're sitting fairly close, these figures are really not relating to each other at all. Um, chances are the woman was inebriated um, by this very strong alcohol. But um, it has definitely a similarity to the way um, Hopper was depicting um, women, especially in these settings. Uh, this one's called Chop Suey, um, based on a second floor Chinese restaurant that he and Joe used to go to. I think it was um, on the Upper West Side or Columbus Circle, something like that. Um, and you have two women here with these little cloche hats, which were very popular at this time. Um, I once read something that the way he, he kind of chops off the letters there, um, suggests that that Y could actually be an X and you're, you know, at first glance, you could see the word sex sort of subliminal thing. I don't know if that's actually true, but one thing I read. Um, so, you know, sh showing these working girls, these, these uh, shop girls uh, taking a break here at this restaurant. Um, it's also sort of suggestive of sound. You know, you have that neon sign making that sort of buzzing sound um, and uh, other senses uh, that are um, inspired by this. Uh, here we have a male figure um, that is just sitting uh, in on a sort of desolate street. Uh, he was very commonly sort of got rid of any extraneous details, like what these stores were, um, and uh, just uh, put the bare minimum of information. Here's a little more specific um, pharmacy. This is another one that is probably um, taken from one of these trips on the elevated train. You see somewhat suggestive um, sort of half clothed woman. Um, and the, the way the light is um, depicted is really uh, beautifully expressive here. So it's sort of voyeuristic the way he's depicting these figures that are really unaware of anyone watching them. Uh, this is Manhattan Bridge Loop, basically just a, a um, portrait of buildings and uh, the way the light and the shadow is affecting the architecture. This is another one of his very famous works, Early Sunday Morning. He um, really captured the way the light looks at specific times of day. Um, so this one doesn't include any humans, um, but it's almost like that, that barber pole is, is like a single human in a way. Um, there are indications that there are people living behind those curtains. Um, and uh, so this was Seventh Avenue. Um, and he apparently the, um, the way the shadows are going is contradictory to the way it actually would be um, on this type of street, uh, the way it's, um, it is um, situated here. Uh, notice also, he's showing these very um, low building, two-story buildings, which are very common in New York at this time period. But look on the right, um, there's this very tall building that's going up. Uh, it's perhaps sort of a, a warning of the encroaching modern kind of uh, very tall uh, buildings and skyscrapers that were going to start to take over New York City. Um, another picture of a single woman, uh, it's called Hotel Room, and he does um, revisit uh, the uh, hotel setting several times in his paintings. 
Uh, so you see she's alone. Um, she has her bag. She's uh, consulting a train schedule for the next morning. Uh, light is very harsh here. Um, it's, it's a very sort of unappealing room. And, um, you know, you can just sense the, uh, the loneliness of this figure. Another one sort of contrasting the inner and the out, outer um, settings there. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, the long um, light uh, and shadows that are cast on the floor here. Uh, so here's another one, Room in New York. Um, a fig you have here a couple um, that are together in a rather small cramped room, but yet they're both sort of pursuing their own uh, solitary activities. Uh, she's playing the piano, he's reading his newspaper. There's not really a whole lot of connection between them. Uh, another one uh, taken from the elevated train. Uh, you can see, you know, you, you don't really see the bottoms of these buildings, just the rooftops and the trees beyond. Very kind of moody, limited um, color scheme here. And he did love depicting some of these architectural decorative elements. Um, and this one is a good example of that. Another one, very specific street corner. Uh, I'm sure it was a very recognizable building. Uh, so now we have Gaz. Um, this is one of his famous works. Um, and apparently he and Joe did a lot of driving around to find the perfect gas station. So you have this uh, solitary figure uh, it looks like a place where not a whole lot of cars come by. Uh, it almost looks sort of like the end of the line. Uh, they say it's sort of like the, the frontier between civilization and uh, the wilderness or nature. Um, like it looks like there's not much that goes on beyond this and not a lot of people visiting. Um, the light again, very important here. Um, you know, is sort of this oasis or something in the middle of uh, uh, not a whole lot uh, of civilization. This one's called Office at Night, and uh, it's showing a woman and man, uh, obviously a secretary and her boss, uh, but um, there's something kind of intriguing about this. I think you can make your own story about it. Um, there are also some very specific details uh, that that um, typewriter in the foreground is very specific. The green desk lamp, um, very recognizable. Uh, but you have to ask like, why are these people in this office so late at night? Is there something more going on here? Um, is there some kind of um, suggestion of uh, a relationship between the two of them? Uh, this is an unusual one uh, involving a nude. This is called Girly Show. And um, Apparently, uh, Joe was the model for this, as she was for many of his works, uh, showing, you know, a sort of desirable figure, but yet separate from the audience. Um, also very harsh light. Um, he really was uh, interested in the effects of fluorescence and um, other types of electric lights at the time. Now we have Nighthawks, probably his most famous work. Um, it's at the um, Chicago Art Institute. And um, I'm gonna turn this over to a little video and I'll talk more about it after. So give me a second.
looking into the space of this diner through these glass windows makes me feel really aware of the sound of my own footsteps on the sidewalk. We're in the Art Institute of Chicago, and we're looking at Edward Hopper's Nighthawks from 1942, this classic American painting that's usually seen as an expression of wartime alienation, of the notion of separation, and it really is about separation. Look at the warm light in that diner, and compare it to the exterior. You get a sense of the quiet conversation that might be taking place inside, but we have no access to that. In fact, there's not even a doorway to let us into this restaurant. There's an immediate implication that we are alone. It almost starts to feel frightening. There's a way that the painting functions as a kind of prism that amplifies or intensifies not only the sense of silence, but also the way in which light fills this space. Look at the way in which the warm light of that interior filters out onto the sidewalk, creating a series of shadows and areas of light that seem to lay over each other and create a complex set of rays on the sidewalk. And the way in which the light it's the glass as it turns around the corner of this building, leading us to that sharp diagonal across the street where that lonely cash register stands as the only recognizable object. But you can imagine life around it at another time of the day, but now it's all eerily silent. And it makes us look up at those windows for some sign of life, but we don't see anything. We can see blinds that have been pulled down by somebody at some point, but seem now completely abandoned. We can imagine perhaps the inhabitants asleep, but there's no presence, no even life. And then we just want to know, what are these figures doing together? Did that couple come in together? Did they meet here? Why is the male figure sitting alone? Why has he wandered into this diner so late at night? What are they talking about? It's all very open. There's not a clear narrative here at all. The only clarity is the sense of isolation, the sense of alienation. And I find this especially interesting if you think about the year in which this was painted, 1942, the, the height of the Second World War. In some ways, the city were emptied out. There were a lot of people that had gone overseas. It was a time of great fear and anxiety in America. That's right. This was really the height of the violence of the war, and nobody knew which way the war was going to turn at this point. And these are subjects that preoccupied Hopper for his entire career, images of loneliness and isolation in the new urban spaces. But this is also a rendering that is particularly American. It's generalized. We don't know precisely where we are. Hopper lived in Greenwich Village, and certainly the brick buildings behind us are reminiscent of the architecture that we might find in the village. But this is not a specific street corner. This is not a specific cafe. It is a kind of stripping away of everything that's non-essential so that we're left with a kind of idealized rendering of these forms of this American experience. And there is a sense of that in the geometry of the composition, the horizontal line of the counter that the two figures in the background lean against, those very geometric forms of the coffee urns, the rectangular shape of that doorway. Well, there's this conflict between these figures going about their ordinary lives and the strict geometry of the space that, that he's imposed in this image. I have to say that I love the fact but those coffee urns are so specific. You can even see the glass straws and see how much coffee is left in them. There is that sign just above this cafe that's advertising cigars for five cents. And there's the specific sort of turn of the cash register across the street. That is, there are signifiers of a kind of everyday American experience, even as this painting has been emptied out. He's left these few clues that really place us in a particular place, in a particular time in our our experience. How about the napkin holders and the, sal <laughs> yes. and the salt and pepper shakers and the mugs of coffee and the glass of water? I mean, there's a kind of love and attention to those very binary objects here that's really compelling. Absolutely. You know, you have those cherry-topped stools that, you know, spin. Yeah. You see the cherry of the counter. So there's a kind of specificity, but at the same time, a generalizing that's happening. That's right. He's given us enough specifics so that we know we've been there, and yet this could be anywhere. Give me a second. Oops. Okay, um, so yeah, really important painting. It's supposedly on Greenwich Avenue, uh, the restaurant. 
Um, but it might be a composite of several places that he was familiar with. Uh, by the way, the Art Institute bought this painting uh, soon after it was completed uh, in the 1940s for $3,000. Uh, and it's probably one of their uh, most prized paintings today. Um, some more uh, urban architecture. Uh, again, this fascination with trains and movement. Uh, and here's another um, very important painting, New York movie. Um, I did uh, mention that he and Joe went to the movies all the time. It was very important to them. Uh, so this is a an earlier version. Um, and you see later on, he sort of lightened up uh, the painting. Um, Joe was the model as usual. Um, and apparently the part where she is standing uh, next to the light here was posed in the hallway of their apartment. Uh, but he did add on the uh, movie theater uh, to the left there. And again, some very specific details, you know, what kind of fabric is on those, those chairs, um, the different uh, decorative details of the theater at the time. Uh, but it's also, if you'd notice the figure, uh, she looks really bored. She's probably, uh, you know, seen this movie a hundred times. Um, and um, it's actually, they don't, there's no real depiction of what that movie is. Um, it, it looks like um, a, a landscape in the mountains, something like that. Um, and this has been compared to um, Manet. So going back again to uh, the Impressionist, this is a bar at the Folie Bergère, where you have another uh, work a girl at work, um, very bored at what she's doing. This is a very important painting of this time period. Um, there's a lot going on here. I'm not going to really go into it, but um, there is a certain um, uh, similarity between the way these women are depicted. Um, this one is called Summertime. So um, this is a very sort of light and airy, um, a sort of optimistic painting, um, very different from many of his. Um, you see the, the girl wearing this sort of semi-transparent dress. Um, it's uh, apparently relating to the sort of economic upswing that was caused by the war. Um, and this is uh, sort of um, showing also that the re relaxed morals that um, were affecting youth in the country at the time and uh, sort of moving past the years of the depression uh, into a new era. Um, cityscape, pretty self-explanatory, Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, so here's another one of these hotel paintings that I mentioned. Uh, and this one has uh, a couple, an older couple, as well as a young woman. Uh, again, this is sort of ambiguity of what all the relationships were, what's happening here, uh, you know, with some very strong sources of light and some of those specific uh, details um, of the interior. And this one is called Hotel Window, a little bit later in his life. And you see this very elegantly dressed older woman and uh, just staring out the window. Again, sort of the sense of loneliness. Uh, this painting, by the way, was bought in 2006 at Sotheby's for about $27 million. Uh, so he did venture out of the city. Um, as well as painting uh, these cityscapes. Um, this is from Monhegan Island, a very popular artist retreat, uh, going back all the way to 1919. This looks like a watercolor. Uh, Railroad Sunset, again, you know, this uh, very strongly colored, um, for some reason, this doesn't look like a hopper to me, really. Uh, there's something very exaggerated about the color scheme here. Um, 
this may be a Cape Cod painting. Um, it's not really specific about that. But um, he did uh, buy the house in Truro uh, in the year 1930. And uh, this is actually a city painting. Uh, that's Joe again posing in this very, very strong, harsh light in the morning. Um, uh, so anyway, he bought the house in Truro in 1930 and went there every summer for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, a lot of his work is, um, is situated there. Uh, so this one is called Second Story Sunlight. It's from quite late in his life. And um, just you're really combining his um, interest in the architecture and the, the way the light falls on the buildings uh, with the figures. A Cape Cod morning, uh, we have a woman looking out a bay window here. And, um, you know, just sort of the sense of anticipation, of anxiety. Um, you don't really know what she's looking for or waiting for here. This one is Cape Cod evening. Um, and you have a couple and a dog. And the dog looks very alert as if something, uh, they, he can hear something that the people don't. Um, and again, we have some very specific architectural elements here. So you can see, you know, fairly modest house. Uh, this is a very rare um, seascape uh, that he did in 1939. And this is Route 6 Eastham. I actually was today. Um, and here's a photo of his house in Truro. As I said, it, it is still standing. Um, I don't think it's really considered a museum, but you can see the views must be incredible from there. Another painting of Truro, you know, which is one of the most uninhabited parts of the Cape, uh, very rural. Uh, this one is Woman in the Sun, and um, you have a nude here, again, fairly unusual for him to paint nudes, um, and the very strong um, geometric light source. Uh, so apparently this was uh, Joe posing for this, um, but he probably took a few liberties since she was 78 at the time. So I hope she looked that good, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, here are people in the sun, uh, again, very harsh light. Um, it doesn't look particularly warm. They're wearing a lot of clothes as they sort of bask in whatever, um, bits of sunlight they can, uh, they can get. Uh, and you have one man sitting behind sort of set, setting himself apart from the rest. Uh, this is called South Carolina Morning, and it was painted in 1955, but it relates to a visit he took um, many years before uh, to Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, he probably did some sketches, um, but then went back many years later to do this painting. That's the only painting in his um, uh, his life that he uh, used an African-American model of a woman here. And a very simple spare uh, background of this one. Uh, he spent some time in Vermont, did a series of landscapes there. He had this very high um, point of view looking down on this uh, setting. Uh, he also uh, went back to Paris, and uh, here's some of his paintings there. And you can see his fascination with the architectural forms in a lot of these works. Dame. So uh, his legacy, um, he influenced many other artists. Um, 
This painting, Chop Suey, sold not too long ago for $92 million. That was the highest price paid for one of his works. Uh, as I said, the, um, the painting house of the, uh, on the railroad was used for the film Psycho. It was also used by Terrence Malick for the movie Days of Heaven. So uh, very influential to the film industry. Uh, some of the artists that credit him as an influence are Richard Diemencorn, Mark Rothko, George Siegel, Banksy, and Eric Fischel. Um, and uh, there's a lot of other things in popular culture that have been influenced by Hopper. Uh, Tom Waits put out an album called Nighthawks at the Diner. Uh, Madonna did a tour, which called, she called it the Girly Show Tour. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates has written short stories based on some of his paintings. It's been parodied in The Simpsons, many, many New Yorker cartoons, and there's many other examples of this. Um, he died of natural causes in um, his studio near Washington Square in 1967, uh, buried in the cemetery in Nyack. Um, his wife died 10 months later and was buried with him. Uh, before that, she bequeathed their collection of more than 3,000 works to the Whitney Museum, where that just had the big show of his. Uh, many other paintings are in the Museum of Modern Art and other, um, other museums around the world. Um, he only painted about 350 paintings in his life, not a huge amount. Um, and uh, as I said, the recent... Uh, sale of 92 million was the most expensive. Um, and unfortunately, this is now in the past, but as I said, I hope some of you got to see it. And uh, I'm gonna end there and I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. So feel free to unmute yourselves. Anyone? Did he take ever take photographs prior to doing a painting or did he paint directly from sketches that he made? Was um, he a photographer in any way? Yeah, I don't think he used photographs very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mostly sketches. Yeah, and no children. Someone asked about children. Do you leave any diaries? I know he gave everything to Whitney. I swear yeah, to actually, Whitney. that was really interesting. He he did document his life quite a bit, um, and that was part of the show at the Whitney. Yes. Uh, some of his writings. Um, he also um, was involved yes. politically somewhat. There was uh, a movement um, by Robert Moses who mm -hmm. put a uh, road through Washington Square Park. And uh, he was very much opposed to that and got involved politically. And some of that, uh, those letters were in the exhibit. So he did save like many, many letters. There were, were quite a bit of writings um, that were preserved. And he has extraordinary detail yeah. in the Nighthawks, the hats that the men are wearing. I know. The position of their body, very, very intense. Yeah, it's very interesting because there is so much detail and then so much emptiness at the same yeah. time, right? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I hope thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. All right, hope to do it again sometime. Thank you. Yeah. I hope so too. Thank you so much.